How is it going, everybody? This is Sean Barnes. I want to welcome you to episode 67 of The Way of the Wolf. We have an interesting show today. Some of you that follow me on social media probably saw a post that I made a couple of months ago about looking for a video editor, someone to kind of help me with creation of content and things like that. I was inundated with all sorts of comments and posts and, and referrals, and I started working my way through them. Now, one of those people that saw that post had reached out to me and... <laughs> In my efforts of trying to work through everybody, I didn't get a chance to get back with him immediately. One of the things that also stood out was how this guest ended up following up with me about once a week, once every other week, something like that. He was really just kind of checking in. Hey, just wanted to remind you. Hey, seeing if there's anything we can do to work together. Hey, I listened to your episode with Terry and loved it. And it stood out to me. And I want to talk about why here on the show, but Justin Hazori, he is our guest on the show today. He's getting into video content editing and, and things like that. I'm super pumped and super excited to have him on the show because we had an introductory call a few weeks ago. And as we were talking, I asked him to share a little bit about himself. I, I wanted to just get to know who he is and his story blew me away and I wanted him to come on the show and have an opportunity to share his story with all of you. So, Justin, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm a little more nervous than I thought I'd be once the camera started rolling, but we're going to work <laughs> through it and make it happen. All right, <laughs> don't, yeah, don't worry about it at all. Okay, so how about we do this? Share with the guests a little bit about who Justin Hazori is. Yes, sir. Well, my goal for the past six years, honestly, is... When everybody, when anybody thinks of the word resilience, I want them to be able to associate my name with that word because I've tried to live a life that resembles this word in everything that I do. So if I had to sum up uh, who I am and how I live my life, it, it would be resilience. Um, and why is that? Well, um, do you want to do you want to get into the whatever you're comfortable now? sharing? Okay. Um, all right. So when we first got on that first initial phone call, and I am. I am still getting, I have been in isolation, which I will uh, uh, continue to explain here in a bit, but I've been in isolation for about six years. So talking to people is not an easy thing for me to do. I have to work through a lot of anxiety and I have to just kind of talk myself through it and, and, and get through the deed here. Um, but by watching your podcast, I, I knew that I could just get the vibe that you were, you have all the right leadership qualities. I knew that you were someone that I could open up to about me with my damaged central nervous system and uh, recovering from a, a pretty traumatic brain injury that I still am dealing with PTSD from. And the way that that injury occurred was I got prescribed a medication for anxiety, for panic attacks. Um, and the reason that I went on it, because I resisted getting on this medication for a long time, for about six months. I was struggling with anxiety. I was seeing a therapist. I was doing all types of breathing exercises and making a lot of progress. I went from being agoraphobic, not being able to leave my house, to going to the mall, uh, I was 21 at the time, so picking up chicks and, and doing all types of different things that an agoraphobic anxiety stress ball shouldn't be able to do. But on this particular night, all these breathing exercises were not working. And I ended up going to the emergency room and they gave me a 0.5 milligram tablet of the generic form of Xanax. And within like 15 minutes, man, this behemoth of a panic attack just completely went away. And to, which to me was a miracle. So they sent me home with a prescription that I took as prescribed. And then within less than 
two weeks, my body was fully dependent on this medication. And by fully dependent, I mean I couldn't go a couple hours without um, going into extreme withdrawal. And this withdrawal is so intense that I basically just accepted my life sentence right then and there. I was like, okay, well, if this is what it's like to get off of this medication, then I guess I just kind of have to take this for the rest of my life. And the worst part about it was nobody, I couldn't, nobody believed me. My therapist didn't believe me. My, the doctors, benzodiazepines is a dis disgustingly misunderstood topic amongst the uh, medical community. So I couldn't get help even when I desperately wanted it. So for the next six to seven years, my life was basically me just scheduling my day around trying not to run out of pills. And it took me to a lot of dark places. Um, I didn't like become a thief or anything, but I was always financially and emotionally bankrupt. I went to the ER countless times because of this medication. I could never keep a job. I could never go on road trips with my friends because I was horrified that I would run out of pills and uh, go back to the hospital. Uh, one time when I involuntarily ran out of pills like I always did because my tolerance kept going up, I had a seizure that was so violent it dislocated my jaw and broke my back in two places. And I had that seizure right there on the floor of the doctor's office of the guy who was prescribing it for me. So it eventually got so bad that um, that I just realized like, dude, I'm either gonna have to shoot myself in the face. Uh, or I gotta go to rehab. And so packing my, uh, packing my bags for rehab felt a lot like I was packing my bags for hell. But my commitment level was 200%. Like I, whatever happens, happens. I'm in this for the long haul. So I tapered off the medication, eight milligrams. Remember, I was, <laughs> I start off with 0.5. So I, eight milligrams is a lot. And I tapered over a period of seven months. And as the dose got less and less, I began to be able to function as a human less and less. And um, when I, when I got completely off, it went from really bad to a whole lot worse. Um, and I, I, I wouldn't be doing people that are suffering right now justice if I didn't briefly describe the horror that thousands of people are experiencing right now. My intestines felt like they were strangled in barbed wire 24-7. I had shooting acid in my veins 24-7. Um, I felt like I was trapped inside a horrifying acid trip. I'm not sure if anybody's done acid, but it's not, if you have a bad trip, it's not fun. Um, I felt like I was possessed by a chemical terror demon, because what it does is the medication soothes your GABA receptors. So the GABA receptors get used to that, and once that's stripped away, they don't know how to not freak out. So you're just constantly terrified all the time. I mean, I couldn't answer the door for, uh, I mean, I know I started this podcast off a little clunky, but I couldn't even answer the door for the UPS guy not too long ago. I mean, completely agoraphobic. And it was just because my chemicals were out of whack. And um, so for the first four months, I had that burning acid feeling every day for 120 days. And I, I was completely incapacitated, had to move up here to Georgia with my dad and I called those the, the fetal position days. That lasted four months, right? Usually alcohol withdrawal or heroin withdrawal, that's three days. Benzo withdrawal, people have to last with, I mean, they have to endure this for years. And the, uh, the acid trip feeling felt like I was, uh, that was about 18 months. I felt like I was trapped inside a bad acid trip for 18 months. And, um, and so it's not like I could just hang out during the withdrawal. I had to, I had to go to work. And um, I'm sorry, were you about to, were you about to say something? Or? No, sir.
Yeah, so I had to I had to go to work on a uh, a crab boat when I was going through this withdrawal, and um, and that was like for a very for a little over five dollars an hour, and that would be a hard job doing right now, like now that I'm feeling a little bit better. But when you throw in barbed wire intestines and bad acid trip. It was just awful, and I was suicidal all day, every day. And uh, but that's around the time where I started watching motivational videos, and I made it. I started watching them religiously, and made it a habit that um, that I would watch them. Like I would watch three minutes of a motivational video every 30 minutes, all day, every day. Either a motivational video or an empowering, I would listen to empowering music. Because my motto was like, okay, well if my brain is raging war against me, then I'm just gonna have to let these motivational speakers think for me, because I'm a wreck. And um... Justin, one of the things whenever you share that, that I find so powerful is that you know, I, I've, I've sat and watched those motivational videos and, and had other guests on where we talk about the, the power of those motivational videos. But, you know, the reality is that gets you pumped up for, you know, a couple of minutes, half an hour, something like that. And I respect that you recognized that just watching one video a day wasn't going to do it for you that you made a concerted effort on watching them every half hour or every hour or listening to music or content that was going to get you in that good headspace. And, and the reason I appreciate and respect that is because you had this element of self-awareness of knowing that, Hey, I need this. And when you start to circle the drain, there's going to be things that can help pull you up and pull you out. And we don't, when we're in that dark place, we don't always want to fire up YouTube and watch a motivational video. You just circle in this drain. And then the fact that you forced yourself to do it is quite powerful. And I have no doubt that it has a positive impact on you and, and your ability to, to pull through this. So kudos to you on being able to recognize that and execute it and build that habit. Thank you. Yeah. And like you said, those, they, they get you psyched for about, what, like 10 minutes, if that, and then you're back to, well, I don't know if this is going to work out, man. And um, so, but if you, I'm telling you, if you listen to them over and over and over, I mean, you hear about rewiring your brain and, and um, it started to develop this mentality because, dude, every morning I had to wake up and I had to go on this damn crab boat and... It was just, I was so depressed, and I knew I was going to be depressed for a long time, but this, um, like, in fact, the depression that I described that comes with benzo withdrawal is the spiritual holocaust. It is a level of depression that is straight up evil. Uh, it, it, it's otherworldly, and, um, but... After listening to motivational video, after speaker after speaker, I began to develop the mindset that, dude, not only am I going to survive this, but I am going to accomplish things in the process. Now, I knew I wasn't going to be some go out and be some motivational speaker as an agoraphobic mess, but I wanted to make goals that were in within my control. And I decided that I was going to go to war against withdrawal. And by war, I mean I'm going to apply discipline, something that I'd never, I've always had a lot of energy and I've had spurts of motivation here and there, but I've never been a disciplined person at that time. So I decided I was going to apply discipline and I made a deep vow that no, what, no matter how bad I was feeling, whatever was on that list today, I was going to do it for that day. And my streak, to the, my longest streak is 632 days of discipline. And I haven't been able to beat that yet, <laughs> but that was my streak. And um, within that time, I, I, I got a lot done, man. I learned how to play the guitar. I learned how to play the piano. I uh, started running marathons. I trained for and completed an Ironman. Um, 
And the best thing, dude, was I discovered the power of this laptop. I learned how to type, um, and I, I took an online course and learned medical transcription, which at that time was like the academic Mount Everest, right? I mean, when I first got off the medication, I couldn't even read. So uh, medical transcription to me now seems kind of like, all right, whatever. But at the time, it was like I was climbing Mount Everest. So I graduated from that, and I was able to get a job at a home healthcare company as a medical transcriptionist. And I wanted, I had discovered this new superpower of discipline and how it really is freedom and how you can really be the architect of your own life if you know that you're going to do what you say you're going to do. And I wanted to share that with people in withdrawal. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of different withdrawal support groups online, as there should be, but not a whole lot of them, unfortunately, are filled with much hope. I mean, there's a few hopeful posts here and there, but it kind of just serves as a people, as a place for people to express their grief. Because, dude, you lose your, I, I feel like I've died and just kind of kept on existing. I mean, I feel alive now, like that video that I, uh, that I feel so alive. Like, I feel pretty good now considering, but, um, Sometimes when I, when somebody talks to me and they're tapering the medication and they're like, hey, I'm about to get off, quite honestly, I feel like I'm talking to somebody who's about to, about to die. Like their life is about to dramatically change. And, um, but I wanted to share with people that, hey, with the power of discipline and the laptop, dude, we can, we can still at least make a, a living for ourselves. And we can we can still do things within our control, like Les Brown. I can't. I think it was Inky Johnson. If you can't do what you want, do what you can. And um, and to me, I, I I found I could run. I could run my marathon. So I run a marathon every weekend. And I, I was posting this stuff. I was posting like my school grades and my guitar songs and stuff like that on these withdrawal groups. And I got a lot of love, a lot of love, a lot of positivity. Um, and then some comments. They weren't really negative. I think they were just misunderstanding what was going on here. Cause they were like, oh wow, you're doing all these things. You must be feeling good. You must be feeling like you're on top of this. And it's like, no man, I cried. I cried every day for two years straight. And I couldn't, I couldn't hop on the phone with my friends because I was too ashamed of the way I was now. And, um, so, one thing that Eric Thomas kept on, uh, one thing that stuck, like, don't cry to quit, cry to keep going. So I would, I would cry while I was lifting weights. I would cry while I was playing guitar. I would cry while I was studying. I would cry while I was learning about business. I would cry, dude, I would cry and listening to some depressing ass songs while I was running my first couple of marathons. But the, the, that's the power of discipline. It doesn't fucking matter how you feel. That's the power of discipline. And um, so I wanted to make my own group called Goals Over Benzos, where I instill that, try to instill that into people that are going through the same thing. Like we can still make a life. For, it might not be, I mean, I still have to wear these doofy looking glasses because I get... Um, overstimulated by my surroundings like I still have a damaged central nervous system and uh, so but I but I do have a life planned out for myself that are all things that I can with control within my injury and it's still a pretty badass life like I still plan on traveling the world running a marathon in each and every country and it's all thanks to networking and and being able to communicate with people like you in Texas 
with on, on, a, on this little laptop, dude, there's still opportunity for people that are messed up. And that goes, it is, I mean, if you have some type of other injury uh, where you can't go to a regular nine to five, first of all, working a regular nine to five kind of sucks, right? <laughs> I mean, a lot of them are not fun anyways. So it's been a blessing in disguise as far as like, hey man, I mean, I've found a whole new world of entrepreneurship that I might not have found otherwise if I was able to just get out and, and rock out a job interview and, and go work somewhere, you know? Well, I think that speaks to the, the power of technology. And I had Dustin Sanchez on a few weeks ago, and, and he was talking through how in this day and age technology is kind of can be used for, he used the term evil. But really what it comes down to is is the intent behind most social media and things like that is to suck you in and sell advertisements. So they're kind of preying on our lizard brain trying to incite the most significant emotional response possible to keep you locked in and engaged. But what we went on to discuss is how powerful it can be if used in the right way. And I appreciate that you recognized in some of the support groups that you were on, that you were in early on, that, you know, the messaging maybe wasn't quite right. Or maybe a lot of people were just kind of posting stuff, and they, but they were still struggling. And then the fact that you took the initiative to create your own Facebook group, Goals Over Benzos, and you're, you're posting the content, you're posting the marathons that you're running and the things that you're doing and keeping it real with people and helping them understand what's going on with you. And then the fact that they're not in this alone, that you've been through it, you're going through it. And the fact that you are using that platform to help inspire and motivate others and let them know that it will be okay. You can make it through this. I think it was Winston Churchill. And I even saw this in, in your book. If you're going through hell, keep going. Yes, sir. Yeah, and the the one of the the rules just real quick here with the goals over benzos is you're allowed you, you're allowed to express your like if you're going to make a post, you're allowed to express your grief about the symptoms, but the post needs to be in the format of hey, I'm dealing with this symptom, I'm dealing with this symptom, but this is what I'm going to do in spite of these symptoms. That's the way that the post that's, the, that's kind of the rule for the, the group. It's not just, I'm going through this, I'm going through this, I'm going through this, I'm going through this. That's for the different support groups. So let's talk a little bit about your book, Resilience. After you and I spoke, I asked you to send me a link so that I could purchase it. Now this is just digital right now, and there's some, some intentionality behind that, which I want to get into here in just a moment. But in reading through that book, I know you and I had had this a similar conversation to what you just shared with me, but reading through that book, my God, so powerful. I was I was sucked in and drawn in in the way you used media and like pictures of yourself running, pictures of yourself with a guitar and a smile on your face with a guitar and having links to certain motivational posts and videos and things that, that were impactful for you, it was just so captivating and inspiring to see what you have endured and, and where you are at today. I mean, quite frankly, your story of withdrawals is that of nightmares. As I was reading through this, I was thinking, my God, I don't know like how this man has, has done it because it sounds just absolute misery. So what prompted you to write the book? Um, well, I wanted to, I just, really, I mean, to just did the help. I wanted to get it off my chest. Like, I felt like um, it was just, I didn't want to suffer in silence. I wanted to get this out and, and, and let people know that Dude, if you take this medication, you're in for... I, I totally understand why someone would take the medication because, like I said, I, I went to the emergency room because of the panic attack. But 
I can almost guarantee that if I had refused the medication and had maybe just kept on working with my therapist, I would have learned like how to work through the panic. And I've, I've like, even now, I mean, like I said, I kind of started kind of clunky with this podcast because it, the, the fucking four, three, two, one came on and all of a sudden I had this like damn <laughs> ice bath of fear and I was like, oh shit. And um, yeah, so I, I have to like learn. I mean, my, my first interview, um, and I'm very, I'm very, I'm very proud of this. I'm going to get, I try not to get emotional again, but my first interview with the home healthcare company, I had a great interview on the phone, but I had been in isolation for years. And then they talked about getting on a zoom call and immediately I was like, oh, sh-. I, I didn't know. I didn't want to, uh, I had to be truthful. And that's when I had to be like, well, I got this condition here that I'm working through and man, I taught, I reached a level of panic <laughs> during that job interview in the, the beginning moments where I couldn't even talk during the job interview. And in my mind, I'm like, I'm about to finally break free from this freaking job that I hated of cutting grass. And I'm blowing it because I can't even talk right now, but I worked through it and once I realized, oh, I can walk through this, um, like I know I, I know I can walk through the concrete wall of fear by myself because I was forced to do it for years, right? But what I've been learning what to, how to do it, um, when I'm in the process of learning how to do, is being vulnerable enough within myself to walk through that fear in front of other people. Because as a man, it's embarrassing as hell. It can be if you don't have the right mindset of it. But I know that it's something that is not is a little out of my control. Um, anyways, I, I'm, I'm not sure what made me get off on this tangent, but I wanted with the book, I wanted to show people that we can still walk through this these crazy symptoms. We can still accomplish things. And so the book, um, I want to give people hope, man, because I didn't have it in withdrawal. I was looking, I was looking for hope, and I was looking for people on YouTube with a little bit of, "Hey, I'm healed," you know, like I'm doing this now, I'm doing this. And even the people that were healed were like, "Well, yeah, I feel pretty good now, and I got a job." Like, it's like, dude, no, I want to hear a, a phoenix story, rise from the ashes, type of stuff. To so that's what I wanted the book to be. And I also oh, I wanted to still, want, real quick, I just wanted to instill, because this is, to me, this is very important, and it was kind of a breakthrough in my own mentality of, no, we're not going to rise from the ashes when we're healed, when we're all completely healed. We have to keep doing it while we're healing, because we might never, the reality is, we might never get back to our normal selves. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's a hard place to come to. And I had a moment with my mom on the beach where I was like, hey, you know, I'm not gonna, I might. <laughs> I might never live like a normal life with a wedding and uh, all that stuff. But what I can promise you is I'm going to make the most of what I got. Speaking of rising up like a phoenix, you touch on entrepreneurship in the book and you touch on some of the, the ventures that you've gone through and the, the medical transcription and kind of making money online and, and like all of these different avenues. Talk me through a little bit about how you found your way to editing content. Yes, sir. All right. So I am still, I kind of consider myself in the process of getting from one entrepreneurship to entrepreneurship, right? Like I haven't made a living yep. yet yep. with the online stuff. Um, and what I was doing for the first few years, I was chasing too many things at one time, all right? And, but then I, when I realized that, oh, I just need to focus on one thing, that's when magic started happening. I found a course, it was about how to become a virtual assistant 
um, how to turn that into a business, and then eventually how to turn it into an agency where you have other virtual assistants work for you. And first I had to learn what a virtual assistant was, and then I had to figure out what services was I gonna provide, and there was like literally 50 or 60 to choose from. So me, with my chase everything at one time brain, went through 50 of them, learned real quick you can't get good at 50 things at one time and i learned a lot like i don't even want to do a lot of these things like administrative tasks as far as email management i don't want to do that so i uh stemmed more towards the creative stuff like i got into web design and video editing but even then i realized dude i can't have a full-time job get really good at web design really good at video editing and have time to market a business so I decided I'm just going to focus on video editing. And my jam is I love making short promotional videos for businesses. That's my, I love, I love that. And I also like um, podcast. I love, if they're interesting, I like going through podcasts because I get to learn and then I can choose the most engaging clips and uh, for Instagram. So that, that's my jam. Video editing has taken me four years. <laughs> I've decided, like, I just consider four, the four years as one long career hunt. But video editing, I'm going to ride with this until the wheels fall off. And I really, really enjoy it. I love that. Yeah, man. That's good stuff, and which kind of brings us full circle back to you and I's initial introduction. And, and again, I have to apologize. Whenever you first reached out... I, I was inundated with others and you, you just, you were not persistent, but consistent in reaching out. Hey, I love this episode. Let me know if you ever have time to chat. I would love to work with you. A few weeks would go by and, and I was, I'm going to say dismissive. I was just so swamped and so busy. It, it doesn't excuse me not reaching back out to you, but finally it was that consistency. I said, you know what? Let's set up a time. I want to talk to this guy. And we did. And I was blown away by your story. And here we are. Now you sharing it on the show. Now, my question to you is, do you want us to work together? Yes. Yes, definitely. Right. And the reason why, All right. okay. because you are my ideal client. Perfect. I love hearing that. Where my head is at right now is needing somebody to to not edit the entire videos, maybe we get there at some point, but right now I need somebody that can help kind of carve up and identify, hey, what's a powerful moment in the show that we can create a quick clip on, post it up on LinkedIn and Instagram and and share those little tidbits of, of stories. Is that something you wanna do? Yes, sir, absolutely. All right, perfect. So how about this? How about we start with this episode? I'll send you the raw data give you the opportunity to go through, clean it up, put some clips together. And then from here on out, we'll start using you for the clip creation. And then if we get comfortable, I'll start having you edit the entire show. Does that sound good? Sounds good. I didn't really want to have to look at myself for, <laughs> oh, for you're going the, to. Uh, the editing <laughs> process. <laughs> yeah, man. That's But yeah, that, that sounds good, man. I definitely appreciate it. All right. I love it. Fantastic. Okay. Now, before we wrap up, is there anything that you would like to share with all of the listeners? Mm. I, I mean, there's not really just one thing. I, I would say definitely uh, check out these motivational videos and, and just be get consistent with listening to them because they really can change your entire outlook on life. And the consistency is the, the main key in discipline. It is. Discipline and consistency. I can't, I can't stress that enough, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. Okay, for all of you listening or watching this on the YouTube channel, in the show notes, the very first link is going to be a link to Justin's book. It's, it's a quick read. I want to say it's like 40 pages, something like that, but the story is so captivating, so compelling. I would highly encourage you to go out there, buy a copy of that book, download it, 
and and kind of hear a little bit more about Justin's story and where he's been, where he's at, and where he is going. So, Justin, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your story. All of you listeners, again, thank you for taking the time to listen to the show and support the show. Please like and subscribe and comment if any of you have any questions or ideas for content. Don't hesitate to reach out to me, Sean at The Way of the Wolf, and y'all have a good one. 